Hi folks, welcome to this video on the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. First of all, apologies, American software, things like that. It's done the American spelling of hemoglobin, there should be an A in there, you know, but worst things happen in life, do they? Oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Right, this is one of those topics that we often dread teaching. It's very difficult to understand this topic. The good thing about it is, though, when a question comes up on this topic, it's typically worth three to four marks, never any more, and it's always the same three or four things you put down, okay? So what I'm going to do once I've shown you this is show you the classic answer that you put down in order to get maximum marks on a question on this topic, okay? First of all, what is this graph representing, okay? As you can see, partial pressure of oxygen is going along the bottom. I, for the sake of like not confusing people, let's just, instead of saying partial pressure, let's just say this represents the amount of oxygen in your bloodstream, in your body, sorry, okay? The amount of oxygen, right? On this axis, you've got zero to 100. Why? Because it's a percentage. It's the percentage saturation, and there's the correct spelling, of hemoglobin, okay? In other words, if I was to draw a line up there, and across there like that, I've gone a little bit wonky, that should have gone to the 100, but it doesn't matter too much. What we are saying is, for this amount, this pressure of oxygen in our bodies, that should go to the 100, 100% of it is combined with haemoglobin. So 100% of the oxygen is attached to haemoglobin in your blood. Fantastic, lovely, great. But that's not great for too long. What do I need that haemoglobin to do? I need it to release it into the muscle tissue because it's the muscles that need the oxygen. It's the organs that need the oxygen to keep them alive and to produce energy. So I need oxyhemoglobin to dissociate. That means to split, to separate. So I actually, the weird thing about this, I've got to read this graph backwards. I want to get to that point. I want to get to a point where all of the oxygen has been released from the haemoglobin. And that way, that blood can then go back to the lungs and pick up more oxygen, ready to do it all again. Okay? So what is this curve basically showing? It's showing, as we've drawn there, for that pressure of oxygen, all of it's still combined with uh, haemoglobin. But what if I draw a line up from there to there? What is that showing? Well, that is showing for that amount of KPAs, kilopascals, that pressure, partial pressure of oxygen, 90% of the oxygen is still combined or saturated to haemoglobin. 10% of it has been released into the muscle tissue. Okay? And if I draw a line here and across there, what is that showing? Well, for that volume of oxygen or that pressure of oxygen, four kilopascals, what we are seeing is that 50% of the oxygen is still combined with haemoglobin, but 50% of it has been released into the muscles and into the organs. So that is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Right, let's get to what they're going to ask you about in the exam. So we'll get rid of those lines, and the question they are going to ask you about is, what happens to this curve during exercise. Well, this curve shifts to the right. It does something like that. So as you can see, okay, if I try and, whoops, if I try and get an arrow in here, that curve has moved to the right there, okay? There's its starting position, it is now moved across to the right, okay? So what, big deal. Well, it is a big deal, actually. That curve shifting to the right is called the Bohr shift or the Bohr effect. Because it was the scientist, I think it was Bohr, who sussed it out and figured it out and, and demonstrated the importance of this. Now, that is worth a mark. Bohr shift and say that the curve shifts to the right. So I might write that in brackets. Because do you know what? Sometimes 
that's worth a separate mark on its own. I would always put both down because it's you're guaranteed at least one, probably going to get two. Okay, so come back to the original point. What's the big deal? Well, we're going to get to that as our last point. Like I said, this is typically a format question. You're probably going to get one for mentioning that. If you're very lucky, you might get two. When does this curve shift to the right? It shifts to the right when two things have happened. Well, sorry, when many things have happened, but two key ones. When there's been an increase in CO2 levels and when there has been an increase in body temperature, that is when that curve shifts to the right. Okay? Why is there an increase in CO2? Why is there an increase in body temperature? Well, I'm exercising, aren't I? That's the reason why uh, both those things have happened. That's why the CO2 levels will increase and that is why my body temperature will also increase. So finally, we get to the thing that I've been saying all along. What's the, what's the big deal? So that curve is shift to the right. How does it benefit us? How does it benefit me? Right, let's try and demonstrate that very, very briefly, okay? If I get, my, if I get a black line on here and I draw up from 10 kilopascals, and draw across there. What we are seeing there is that at that pressure of oxygen inside my body, inside my inside my body, yet yeah, 95% of it of that oxygen is still saturated or combined with hemoglobin. So I've still got 90% oxyhemoglobin. Sorry, 95% oxyhemoglobin. 5% of it has been released into the muscle tissues. But remember, I'm exercising now. So, wouldn't it be good if I could release more oxygen into the muscles quicker from the blood? Well, that is why the curve has shifted to the right. Let me do a yellow line on this now. Now that this curve is in this new position on the right, so the red curve, for the same pressure of oxygen, I've now been able to release... 75% of it. 75% is still combined with hemoglobin, but 25% of the oxygen has been released into the muscles instead of just 5% before the curve shifted to the right from the blue line to the red line. That gets more exaggerated when I get to these points here. Look, if I draw up from there and draw across from 6 kilopascals of um, oxygen... I'd released about 20% of the oxygen had separated from, had dissociated, sorry, from the haemoglobin, had been released into the muscle. But now the curve has shifted to the right again during exercise. Just over 60% of the oxygen has been released, dissociated from haemoglobin into the muscle tissue. So what we're saying is by this curve shifting to the right, by doing that, Okay, moving from the blue line to the red line, the haemoglobin is releasing more oxygen into the muscles. Now, that is massively important when I'm exercising because I don't want lots of oxygen in the blood. I want it in the muscles. I want oxyhemoglobin to dissociate quicker. And that's the benefit of that curve shifting to the right. So let's have a look at a typical question and how we would answer this. Okay, so here's how a question might look on this. Sometimes you'll get a diagram like the one on the previous slide. Sometimes you won't, okay? So, during exercise, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve moves to the right. Describe the causes of this and why it occurs. Four marks. Now, a few key things here. Number one, they've said it moves to the right in this question, so I'm not going to get a mark for saying that in my answer. So, I've got to say four different things. What else have I got to say? I've got to say the causes. So what causes the curve to shift to the right? And I've got to say why it occurs. What is the benefit of it shifting to the right? So I'm not going to get a mark for saying it moves to the right, but I'm going to get a mark for saying what this is. So I'll get a mark for saying this is called the ball shift. Or you can put the bore effect. There's one mark, so I'm going to give myself a tick for mentioning that. Sometimes I've even seen the question saying, during exercise, the oxyhemoglobin shift undergoes the bore shift. 
describe the cause of this and why it occurs. Well, in that one, it said the ball shift, but it hasn't said that the curve shifts to the right. So I get a mark for saying it shifts to the right in that instance. But I'd always put them both down just to be on the safe side. But this is called the ball shift. What the cause of it? Well, it's caused by an increase in blood CO2 levels. Tick. And it's also caused by, I should have actually put a comma there, and I'll give myself a tick. And an increase in body temperature. I'm just going to put body temp, I'm a sneaky cheat. Never abbreviate in the exam though. I know I keep repeating it in all these videos, but it's worth saying. So I've got one, two, three marks, and I've described the causes, okay? I've said what it's known as in terms of when it shifts to the right. It's called the bow shift, okay? So I'll keep that there. It's called the bow shift. I give a mark for saying increase in blood CO2 and an increase in body temperature. So I've got three. So why it occurs? My final big point. Why does it occur? This allows oxygen to dissociate from haemoglobin more easily. I will release more of the oxygen from haemoglobin. I will dissociate it more. Tick. That is the only reason why it shifts to the right. So there are any other you know, things to say on that point, explain why it occurs. So that is the classic four mark answer. Allows O2 to dissociate from haemoglobin more easily. Some people like to put more readily. Absolutely fantastic. Here's a top tip. If nothing else, remember those four points. Every time a question comes up on this topic, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, it's these four things that they are after. The curve shifting to the right called the bow shift, caused by an increase in blood CO2 levels and an increase in body temperature. And the result is that it allows oxygen to dissociate from haemoglobin more easily or more readily. Okay, good luck with it, folks.